Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm elect Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council. Uh, and I'm on behalf of the Atlantic Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative and our Eurasia Center, I'm honored to welcome you to what I think will be a fascinating conversation today on defending sovereignty and information space, countering Russian state-sponsored bullying. This event's been made possible through the cooperation that we have with the Estonian Embassy here in Washington. We'd like to thank the opportunity to thank our partners. Uh, we have Ambassador Veziov with us today, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll be having this conversation on the eve of uh, SICON, a major undertaking uh, from our colleagues in Estonia that opens tomorrow here in Washington. Before today's conversation, uh, the Kremlin's foreign policy, which is steeped not only in nostalgia for Russian but also Soviet imperialist power, has demonstrated itself to be aggressive, disruptive, and defiant toward international norms time and again. Uh, most of us would cite the obvious cases of Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, the cyber attack against Estonia itself as blatant examples. Russia's threat to the sovereignty of other nations has not, nations has not only been confined to physical activities. The Kremlin has been designing influence operations, or what the Soviets for long called active measures, in foreign information spaces for decades. And these efforts have not always received the attention that they might deserve. Um, but just two years ago here in 2016 in the United States, we were reminded of the threat that they pose by way of Russia's interference in the elections here with a coordinated online disinformation campaign that many in our team have helped track and unpack. The Kremlin attacked at the heart of, US, of the United States, our democracy, and by way of our openness, diversity, and freedom of speech, turning one of our greatest assets of the United States into a vulnerability, if you will. We've seen state, Russia's state-sponsored disinformation operations have proven to be a bargain as well. They've been cheap to operate with virtually little cost for, in terms of response. So the Atlantic Council we understand the Russian state-sponsored disinformation has been a national security challenge, not only here, for many of our European allies, and particularly those in Europe's east. Our Estonian allies in particular have learned many lessons, sometimes difficult lessons, on how to build societal and technological resilience, and how geopolitical tensions shape the thinking and actions of nation states. Um, so now, more than ever, we must work together with our Estonian, our Baltic, our European allies to understand these past lessons, and create the actionable policy solutions to defend forward against online disinformation from the Kremlin. We need to devote real resources to protecting our increasingly information-based societies. So it's that ambition that is close to the heart of three of our programs here at the Atlantic Council and why they've been coordinating their work across these lines. Our Cyber Statecraft Initiative, uh, led by Clara Jordan, who is uh, with us, uh, housed in our Scowcroft Center, aims to bridge the tech and policy communities encouraging the creation of policy for cyberspace that is forward-looking and true to our democratic values. Meanwhile, our Eurasia Center's mission is to enhance transatlantic cooperation to promote stability, democratic values, and prosperity across Eurasia. And in tandem, they work with our Digital Forensics Research Lab, uh, which works has a power, powerful suite of capabilities to identify, expose, and explain disinformation where and when it occurs. So in line with our council ethos, all these programs emphasize the same thing. To, to assemble diverse coalition of experts, policymakers, industry leaders, and members of civil society to safeguard our tried and tested democratic systems and an era that is bringing new challenges. So with this, it's my honor to introduce today's discussion on our panelists. I'm uh, delighted to have uh, as our moder moderator today, uh, His Excellent John Excellency Jonathan Seviov, the Estonia's ambassador to the United States. This is his third posting here in Washington. Welcome back to DC. Uh, before assuming his duties here, he worked uh, in the Estonian Ministry of Defense for 10 years, playing a leading role in shaping Estonia's domestic and international defense policy. I'll hand it over to him to moderate the conversation with a terrific group of panelists. I'm delighted to welcome back to the stage Ambassador uh, Victoria New 
Newland, who is the Chief Executive Officer at the Center for New American Security, but she has been one of my inspirations and mentors throughout my career as a former uh, Foreign Service Officer, Assistant Secretary, U.S. Ambassador NATO, uh, uh, and fabulous colleague. She's joined by Dr. Thomas Ridd, the Professor of Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and General Riho Taras, the Commander of Defense Forces of Estonia. So uh, before they come to the stage, just one last reminder for all of you who are here with us and are joining us online uh, to please join the conversation with your questions and comments by tweeting at cyber, the handle cyberstatecraft and using the hashtag ACCyber. Um, with that, let me invite Ambassador, please, to the stage and his colleagues to begin the conversation. Thank you, Damon. Um, hello. Uh, it's glad to be here back, not only in Washington, D.C., but also at the Atlantic Council. <clears throat> Damon, you are doing a wonderful job at promoting transatlantic relations and European security, also uh, American security. Yeah, and it is a pleasure for me to uh, moderate um, this panel at such a great institution, and considering especially the fact that we have such great panelists. The, uh, the people on the panel do not need introductions. Damon uh, has graciously also introduced the panelists, but I do have to say that uh, Ambassador Nuland has been a strong friend of uh, Europe's for um, decades. She has served uh, as a, a, an American diplomat for more than 30 years, uh, most recently as Assistant Secretary. But Ambassador Nuland has also been Ambassador to NATO, uh, the cornerstone of both European as well as American security. Um, Professor Reed um, needs no introduction either. Uh, it serves as one of the leading experts on the discussion at hand. He um, is professor of strategic studies at Johns Hopkins University, has written a book, and I will certainly ask about the book, uh, Cyber War Will Not Take Place, back in 2013. I'm keen to learn if he has changed his mind in the past few years. He has uh, testified on information security in front of the US Senate, but also in front of uh, the German Bundestag and the UK Parliament, which proves that these topics are of interest not only here in the United States, but also in Europe. He's currently a professor in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. Between 2003 and 2010, he worked at major think tanks in Berlin, Paris, Jerusalem, and Washington, D.C. And finally, last but not least, General Richard Deros uh, landed in Washington late last night. Uh, he's commander of Estonian Defense Forces. And actually, he's uh, in his last three weeks now, I think, uh, certainly last month, uh, in his tenure as commander of defense forces, has served in that position for seven years. I think uh, I'm not mistaken when I say that he's currently the longest serving commander uh, in all of NATO's uh, defense forces. Prior to that, uh, he was chief of staff of the Estonian Armed Forces, and prior to that, he was permanent secretary at the Estonian Ministry of Defense, which in Estonia is probably the most important position in government. It's a joke, because that <laughs> used to be my position. Uh, <clears throat> In any case, a wonderful panel. I should also say that, um, as always, uh, uh, we are, uh, not as always, but uh, as is often the case when discussing uh, Russian malign activities, we are on record, uh, this time uh, publicly so. The cameras in the background are filming. So we should uh, be aware of the fact that uh, not only the wonderful audience here, but the thousands and thousands of people watching at home pay very close attention to everything that we do say. Uh, with this in mind, I do hope that this is going to be a free-flowing discussion amongst the panelists and later on with uh, your questions and comments to your audience. And my role here is really uh, to be the moderator, so I hope to, to uh, keep the, the discussion going. Defending sovereignty and inf uh, information space, countering Russian state-sponsored bullying is the topic and I thought it would be wise to ask uh, Professor Reed to uh, open our discussion by giving us a brief overview of uh, what has been going on, whether the tactics uh, that we're seeing have evolved, uh, whether the strategy behind these tactics uh, makes sense, whether we understand it, what in general is going on. Professor. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So I'm currently uh, finishing up a book on this very subject. It's called Active Measures, a History of Disinformation. So I, I uh, applaud your risk appetite um, here, uh, inviting an author to, write about, uh, to speak about an ongoing uh, book project. It's always a bold move. So I'll, I'll try to be uh, as concise and as intelligible as possible. There is a very long history of disinformation and active measures. Uh, more, uh, I decided to start the book, because uh, I had to uh, just make a cut somewhere, with, the op with Operation Trest, Operatia Trest, in, um, which actually started in Tallinn in 1920, in the early 1920s, and then carried on for um, six years. And it was, an, it's, 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 it was such an important operation because it showed the uh, Cheka and then GPU, the predecessor organization to KGB, that these kinds of deception, conspiracy, active measures with multiple layers of lying and deceiving can actually be very effective uh, back in the day against the Russian emigration, um, which was plotting a counter-revolution from abroad. And they basically neutralized them. But if we look at that history, I think I w would like to highlight uh, sort of just one feature that we still observe today. Um, Perhaps one of the most significant cases that didn't get a lot of attention anywhere recently is a KGB operation from 1959-1960 that I would just uh, highlight very briefly. KGB started a wave. This was 14 years after the end of the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, after the end of World War II. And KGB saw that the Germans, the West Germans, were struggling with the trauma of World War II with the lingering violence, with uh, lingering anti-Semitism, obviously, as well. And uh, they decided to stoke the, f uh, to stoke the fans of this uh, ethnic hatred in Germany and started a wave of anti-Semitic attacks. Uh, this is a pure provocation. They painted swastikas and uh, uh, Juden roused Jews out across synagogues, ac across cemeteries in, uh, in, in West Germany, but also here in the United States. We had in incidents in 15 cities uh, across the world. So this is a remarkable incident because very quickly what happened is that they understood that it actually works. Uh, very quickly, the fake, uh, fake anti-Semitic incidents were joined by real anti-Semitic incidents. And even they couldn't tell the difference anymore between what, where their own active measure ended and the actual uh, real uh, hate was taking over. Um, let, let me just jump forward. Uh, so this is the first point I wanted to make. There's a long history, and many of the dynamics that we can observe today in, on social media, in fact, have a pre-social media history. The second point I'd like to make is that active measures have, have become more active. And I've become more active because in our technical environment today, it's easier to scale up these operations. It's easier to run these operations faster, build in feedback loops, adjust them in real time. And um, it's also easier than it was in the past to rope in and recruit activists who think they're doing the right thing. Uh, but in fact, uh, so the most prominent example would be WikiLeaks, obviously. Uh, uh, helping the uh, election interference in 2016. Let's, you know, if we want to give Julian Assange the benefit of the doubt, then he didn't know what he was actually, who he was actually helping in this operation. Uh, we don't actually need to assume that he knew that he was an influence agent for a Russian intelligence agency. Most likely, they wouldn't reveal to him who they were anyway in that situation. It's better to have somebody acting on the basis of sort of, of from a moral high ground, even if it's, if it's not accurate. Obviously, from an intelligence perspective, that's how you want to run these operations. So operations more active because they're digital. Also, because hacking, breaching targets, and exfiltrating information uh, data at scale has become possible. And uh, uh, the new dynamic here, and this is sort of a point that I would like to tease out, my third point here. The new dynamic is that active measures are more active, but also less measured than they were in the past. Less measured in the sense uh, that, let's have a quick look at what happened in 2016. Many of the 
leaks that we saw, that applies to some of the DNC leaks, other leaks as well that started earlier, uh, and then of course to the Podesta leaks, the value creation at the time was not done by GRU, by any Russian agency. They didn't actually know the good, gem the, the, the really useful bits and, of information inside the leaks. They put, just put the whole leaks out there wholesale and left it to mainly American journalists and other Americans to go in and find the really newsworthy elements. Back in the day, uh, in the 80s, which I think was the high water mark of Russian active measures and East German active measures as well. Stasi was even better at this than KGB, there's no question in my mind. The high water, high water mark in the 1980s required them to actually create that value themselves. They had to sometimes come up with elaborate forgeries, uh, often based on factually true information, obviously, because they had to get past the journalist head of uh, Stasi Active Measures at the time has this great quote, he said, what would active measures be without the journalist? Basically he said there's a, there was a marriage between active measures operators and journalists because they couldn't let go of each other. It's just too attractive to cooperate, uh, in unwittingly obviously. But fast forward in 2016 and still today, um, journalists start and the public writ large starts earlier in creating the value that actually becomes an operation later on. And I think this is, this, this is one aspect of active measures being uh, less measured and, and more active. But another one is, uh, another one is this, and I'm, uh, I'll try to make this as provocative here and as, as, as interesting as possible. Um, one thing that I struggle to find a historic precedent for in the history of the Cold War and there were thousands and thousands of active measures to study. It's really hard to contain this subject in one book. It's, it's almost impossible. But one thing that I can't find a precedent for is the situation that we're in right now in the sense that we overestimate the effect of active measures. During the Cold War, we usually arguably sometimes underestimated the effect of active measures. That was the norm. Der Spiegel, just to give one example, sometimes called active measures, and they were at the receiving end of a lot of them, uh, pranks. Because after all, they really operated like pranks sometimes. Very low quality, covert only for a very short amount of time. They were never, active measures are never designed to be properly covert forever. They're only designed to be covert for a short amount of time and then to be discovered. But today, we are in a situation that people don't consider these operations pranks. Even here in the United States, there are a lot of people who think that a Russian active, measure, active measures campaign in 2016 handed the ultimate, uh, handed the presidency to Donald Trump. I think a lot of people here in the United States, even in Washington, would subscribe to the view that the Russians ultimately affected the outcome of the 2016 general election in this country. I mean, think about the gravity of the statement. There is no way we can empirically prove this statement. It's an unknowable fact. By deciding collectively, a lot of people, not everybody, I certainly don't make that assumption, by deciding to blame a domestic, domestic weaknesses, domestic ills on foreign interference without having the actual evidence to support it, because the situation is just too complex, we are defaulting into a mindset that we actually see in Russia itself. We're defaulting into a mindset that blames domestic ills on foreign interference, into a mindset that we see in Turkey, for example. We're defaulting into a mindset that we see in non-democratic societies. And I think that's the real danger. Uh, the danger is that we are deceiving ourselves more than we are, than, than that we're being deceived by some you know, magically competent active measures uh, system in another country. Because that's the other lesson of history here. Active measures are always imperfect. They're very, almost always not really that impressive if you look closely. They're sloppy. They're done by pragmatists, not perfectionists. Um, and oftentimes, it's not the best people, actually, who get pushed into the active measures uh, departments in intelligence agencies, but people who are a little weird, uh, a little eccentric. Um, so. I have no doubt 
today, and I'll close with that, I have no doubt that today there are lots of memos written in Russian intelligence agencies that claim success. That say, hey, we did it. You know, look how scared they are. They're still talking about it two years later, etc. Because that's what intelligence agencies do. They're bureaucracies. They want promotions, uh, more money, holidays, whatever, uh, and overstate their success. Um, but we shouldn't join them in that, uh, in that overstating their own success. We should be more skeptical. Thank you. Thank you, General Teras. Estonia is often viewed as a, as a frontline state. In, uh, in this domain, however, geography probably matters less than in uh, many other more conventional domains. Um, do you think that we are uh, still uh, witnessing the future in Estonia when it comes to um, uh, malicious activities like the ones uh, pr the professor was talking about? And if so, what, what is it that we Estonians are doing uh, to counter these uh, challenges? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm very happy to be here on the, st uh, on the stage here in Atlantic Council. Uh, and I very much agree with Professor, uh, as he said, that that's nothing new. And, and uh, from a Estonian point of view, uh, being a frontline state is nothing new for us as well. We've been that for, for long years. And, uh, and uh, in Estonia, we know people don't know uh, about their uh, attempted coup d'etat, uh, 1924, 1st of December, where actually everything what we saw in Crimea happened uh, more than 70 years before it happened in Crimea. And all the same patterns of behavior, uh, all the so-called militarily said lines of operations were used, uh, active and passive measures, uh, pressure from the, from the border, a little green man, if you want, uh, over the border, trying to take over the telegraph and, uh, and the communications, which that time was a bit more um, sl slower, the communications, than it is today. But it is actually exactly the same, uh, same pattern, so nothing new in it. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to deal with it uh, permanently. And Estonia, uh, throughout the last uh, uh, more than 25 years of, uh, of independence, uh, has been several times under the under the pressure and attack of, of Russians uh, uh, on the on the w w on the lines of operations below the military conflict. Uh, I think it is important to see that the last measure always needs to be a military power as well. It's not uh, Ukraine. Uh, Crimea was not taken over by only active measures or or info information operations, but, uh, but militarily, uh, same happened uh, in Georgia. So whatever uh, the Russians do uh, to influence uh, their neighbors, the most dangerous part uh, is for the, for the sovereignty is still the, the real uh, mil military conventional or unconventional capabilities. They, they should not be uh, put aside, but how we how we try to combat uh, the the Russian uh, activities, uh, and I should admit we have not had kind of a heavy uh, influence activities in Estonia uh, even before Crimea or after Georgia. There's kind of a background noise always. If we say something, they would respond. But even during our big NATO exercises. We have not had an active uh, Russian uh, uh, operations uh, in the information space against us. It doesn't say about the intelligence uh, attacks, but so that the intelligence uh, uh, is working um, with, with their measures uh, permanently. What we can do with it, we need to publish it. We need to talk about it. We need to tell everybody what happened. And, uh, and bring it uh, to, the, to the newspapers. Some nations do not, uh, do not uh, publish their court spies. I think, I think that is the very, very wrong policy, because you need to show everybody that, uh, that the GRU does what it does, that the FSB does what it does. We have, had, uh, we have caught more than 10 uh, uh, Russian uh, spies and intelligence officers in the last uh, 15 years uh, in the military, 
in their security services, etc. But we tried to go to the court and charge them and show everybody that they are, they are caught. So uh, I think that is important. The same thing with the, with the cyber activities. I think we are a bit afraid of uh, saying, well, this, this attack came from Russia. But if we know it is, and if the government knows it is, so you need, you need to stand up and say, yes, we were attacked from, from Russia uh, and, and go, go with it. Because uh, the same international law applies to, to cyberspace as it does for all the criminal activities. So I, I, I think we are a bit of afraid of telling everybody. What we did in Estonia, uh, we, uh, we have uh, 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 created a defense strategy which includes a topic uh, which we name uh, psychological defense. Uh, it was very heavily argued by the journalists whether we want to start propaganda in Estonia. But for me, uh, they are, or in th in this uh, paper, they are identified three main lines of operation. What we can do to combat the Russian activities. First is how we make sure ourselves that we believe in ourselves, that our nation believes in the country and in the government. And nation means not only Estonian speakers but the Russian Estonian speakers, etc. Uh, and and the question there. I think that was what failed in Crimea. People did not believe. They thought the government is so corrupt for them, it is absolutely equal, whether it is Russian, Ukrainian, or whatever. They, they didn't uh, start to fight because they, the, the cohesion of the nation was not given. Uh, I think to work with it is important for every nation, to make sure that you believe in your country, you, you, you know your anthem, you know what the flag is, you go and uh, celebrate the 100 years of, uh, of Estonian independence. It is all to make sure that you believe in your country and everybody does that. The second line is how to make sure that uh, that our allies and friends believe in us. Uh, and that is another effort uh, which needs to be taken care carefully, is to make sure that uh, that the American citizens or German citizens would not think that Estonia is a little ugly Nazi country on the edge of Europe, as the Russians try to depict it. Uh, but it is a modern uh, IT-oriented uh, uh, democratic liberal country uh, who wants to be part of the responsible, responsible uh, alliance of values. Uh, and that is not always easy, because uh, to address the people is always very difficult. And you cannot do propaganda. You, you need to do um, classical uh, uh, strategic communication work. And only the third line is how to fight the Russian propaganda, uh, how to uh, publish everything they do. and, and uh, uh, and uh, and show the lies to the people, and uh, therefore we have uh, created uh, a homepage uh, which is called Propa Stop uh, e -E Echo Echo. Uh, on, on there, our journalists uh, who are uh, willing to be part of the uh, country's volunteer force, so they put on uniforms and they go through the through the pages uh, where uh, try to identify propaganda pieces and then put them on the s or open up the propaganda part of it i think russians have, be, have been successful in in propaganda towards their own people they their narrative is europe is evil uh, and uh, there was a study done in ukraine after the ukraine crisis where uh, they have looked at what in the Russian news agencies and papers, uh, how the European countries uh, have been uh, depicted, and to 80% it was negative. Whatever country it was, even Finland was 88, ta 88 uh, times out of 100 was depicted as, as an evil country, as something uh, weak. So h horror of the world, uh, life in Europe, that's w what the mindset is. They are against our, they show Europe as against their, say, conservative, uh, religious uh, values, uh, homosexuals, all of them, and so on. Uh, and that doesn't matter if you have good relations or bad relations with Russia. That's the narrative to make the people understand that Europe is evil and we need to fight and we are surrounded. And I think the most dangerous thing is that the Russians think they are surrounded by the enemies from all sides. Uh, so I think uh, Russian propaganda has been successful in, in Russia towards the Russians. 
it is much more difficult, and that would be my last example, uh, towards the uh, Europeans. Even the Russian-speaking uh, minorities in Estonia, if they, would, if they, they are in the information space of the Russian channels, uh, classical Russian uh, TV channels, where every day they get the Putin is good, Crimea belongs to uh, Russia, etc. And they do believe it. But if in the same news it was said that uh, the life in Estonia is very bad, that you, are, you're, you have to fight your, uh, your, uh, your life uh, for, for your life every day and you don't get uh, pensions, and uh, etc., that they don't believe. Because if it's raining outside and you tell uh, somebody that it is not raining, you still believe your own eyes and not what you said. So uh, that w we have identified that ki kind of a difference. Uh, it is more difficult for the Germans, uh, uh, to the Germans, uh, but still uh, I think uh, they are not very successful on convincing uh, European public opinion in the last years. Every time they are almost reaching the aim, uh, Putin uh, overloads it, be it Georgia or be it uh, Ukraine, because after Ukraine the number of the people believing that Russia is a normal country went significantly down, even it was propaganda-wise told them that it is the case. So uh, I think we need to tell the stories to our people, publish everything Russia does, be it in intelligence field, propaganda field, openly, publicly discuss it more and more, and that will help us, I think, uh, significantly. Okay, Ambassador Nuland, you have extensive experience <laughs> in, in all of this. Uh, Patient zero. <laughs> is, is General Deras right? Should we uh, attribute publicly? And, and what else should be done internationally to keep us strong and, uh, and fight back? Well, we certainly need to do that. We need to educate our citizenry. Uh, but it is difficult in an environment where we are not well organized as a government to identify what we're seeing, to excavate it, to work on appropriate policy responses. I think Estonia, as a leader in this field, uh, has an advantage because you've been working on it very carefully for a long time. You have strong, consistent, um, cross-party uh, government efforts to expose and combat it, and you're a relatively small country with um, only one major line of propaganda coming from Russia, which is that Estonia is not such a great place to live, which, as the general said, um, is very obvious to even Estonian Russians that they have chosen to live in Estonia rather than to live in Russia for very obvious reasons. Uh, but before I jump into the what is to be done, or as the Russians would say, um, I want to just take a minute to uh, thank the Atlantic Council for having all of us, and particularly to Fred and to Damon for their leadership on this subject. When I was still in government, the Atlantic Council was already pil pil piloting some of the best excavation of what we were seeing in this active measures campaign, and they continue to lead on this front. So thank you to my friend Damon and to everybody here. Uh, you know, I, th I think it starts with good leadership uh, within the national government uh, and then goes to a relationship between the government and companies and journalists and citizens. Uh, with regard to the United States, I have in the past made four structural recommendations about what we need to be doing here, which I think can be replicated in virtually any democracy. I think Estonia, again, leads in many of these things because you've already implemented these things, but we still don't see much of this being done properly in the United States. So first and foremost, uh, you need a whole of government effort and you need a standing fusion center after September 11th. Uh, we instituted the National Counterterrorism Center, which brought together all of the government e experts on terrorism to look at the intelligence coming in, to compare information about tactics and techniques, to reach out to other governments for uh, intelligence collaboration, but also for co uh, cooperation in the field. We still don't have a USG whole of government effort uh, against this 
set of active measures, whether it's coming from Russia, whether it's coming from some of the other uh, autocratic states now looking to copycat the techniques, um, everyone from Iran to North Korea to now China, to the new threats coming at us that we haven't seen yet, which I'll come to at the end. Uh, when we, in the late Obama administration, got the presidential signal to come together as an administration and look at what had happened, the totality of what we knew about the 2016 elections, even those of us who were receiving information from all parts of the government were amazed at how much bigger and hairier the elephant was uh, because we had not had this structure to coordinate. So just having a whole of government center which uh, assembles information, looks at options for policy, um, and gives recommendations uh, is a first step. A second step, and particularly this is important in the United States context because uh, the major uh, technology companies are American-based, we have to have a much stronger, more persistent, more consistent collaboration between uh, government and the private sector, a national commission, if you will, between government and the technology companies, uh, so that we can create a safe space to look at what is happening. As we know from 2016 and since, it's very difficult for the companies for proprietary reasons, for business reasons, for uh, vulnerability of uh, their system reasons to collaborate naturally well together. They're doing better now than they were a couple of years ago. But when government can create a place where everybody can pool information, everybody can look at how their platforms are being abused, everybody can collaborate on the right responses and strategies for hardening their platforms um, and our national uh, structures against this kind of um, predatory behavior, we will do better. So for example, this national commission between government and industry could look at whether there are more things that can be done in the regulatory space, rather than having Congress uh, you know, iterate its own forms of regulation, working with companies one at a time, to, to get all the companies in the room together with the executive branch, with the legislative branch, to look at things like uh, the kinds of things that some companies are starting to do. You know, should you uh, require uh, clear identification of political ads? Should you require the kind of um, back office that exposes who's putting information out um, have more identifying information, these kinds of things. Uh, similarly, in the legal sphere, a lot of the companies have said uh, to us, have said to others, that none of these activities are criminalized. You know, obviously the Justice Department can bring indictments as it has against individual Russians that it finds, but there is very little in the criminal code that makes it um, a crime for Americans to participate in this, to be duped uh, into this, to uh, be the witting or unwitting uh, accelerators of this kind of information. And perhaps if, if there were a legal cost, a, a jail sentence at the end of it, uh, it would make it much harder for these foreign governments to recruit or find um, folks who are already discontent in society to augment and amplify their messages. Similarly, the very difficult question of uh, deterrence. You know, we, we have a lot of experience from the nuclear age of, of signaling and exposing uh, our ability to uh, counter um, dangerous activity is if it's uh, sent our way. There is, for, for obvious reasons, the intelligence communities around the world don't want to demonstrate to potential adversaries that we too can um, make their life difficult in the cybersphere, but nonetheless, uh, understanding what the counter capability is might cause some pause uh, in these uh, states where governments are taking um, a lot of action and not feeling any pain. Similarly, uh, whether we should, could, would respond better in kind and have an agreed playbook of how to do that, um, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Um, and then there's the educational piece. The third thing that we've got to do uh, is better advise and protect uh, our companies when they do the right thing. 
So for example, in the context of export controls, in the late Soviet period, we had a very rigorous US government effort called the MTCR to ensure that we were not allowing our companies to export dual use military equipment to uh, adversary states, and we still have pieces of that. And the US government actually made a firm partnership with the companies on what they could do and what they couldn't do, protected companies that were under pressure from foreign governments to, to sell certain things, et cetera. Uh, similarly, we should have a strong advisory arm and advocacy arm for US private companies that are willing to stand up, whether it is saying that they <coughs> won't put their servers in foreign capitals because they don't want the information vacuumed by by that government, or whether it's um, engaging in conversations about privacy, com conversations about uh, exposing who's using the platform, all of these kinds of things. It's very difficult now for companies to deal with uh, tough governments without the protection of their own government um, to, to back them up when they stand up to the pressure that they might be getting to be more open and more accommodating to this kind of behavior. And then the last thing is uh, we need to coordinate better with our allies, that's absolutely obvious, but we don't have a single belly button in the government. There's no <coughs> international coordinator around this issue. There are about 15 of them who go to the 15 <coughs> multilateral meetings, but unless and until we decide uh, as a democracy how we are going to interface on this issue with countries like Estonia, our other NATO allies, our EU partners, the democracies around the world, and create a single set of humans who are working on all aspects, whether they're working uh, in US, EU context, multilateral fora like the UN, et cetera, uh, it's just going to be a thousand flowers blooming and the, and the effort is not going to come together firmly. So. Um, I would say that the, the, the problem that we have is, is, is not simply that uh, this is b that the techniques of active measures that have been going on forever, as we all know, and particularly those of us who are students of the, of the Soviet Union, um, but that these, <coughs> these things are being turbocharged by technology and brought into every living room in every one of our countries such that the pool of recruits, witting or unwitting, to augment and accelerate this nefarious activity is much bigger than it ever was, which makes it harder to debunk it because it has to be done in, in real time. So um, the, other, the last piece I would just point to is, is the money piece. It's not simply a matter if you're worried about um, corrosion of democracy or perversion of democracy or um, you know, efforts to uh, sow discord in society, et cetera. It's not simply about what's happening in the information space. It's also what's happening in the political space, where you know some of the most successful operations that the Kremlin has led in the last two to three years are actually not here in the US, they are in Europe, where they have accelerated the polariz polarization of, of politics by supporting, both with their propaganda effort and with other measures, uh, political parties on the far extremes, which means in countries with coalition governments or with multi-party systems, if you have uh, high numbers elected on the far far extremes, it's very difficult for coalition governments to come, to come together, for the center to hold in terms of governance. So that's been a successful strategy, whether it was in Italy, you could argue that they made inroads in, in <coughs> Germany, and then other places that, that are obvious, like, like Hungary, et cetera. So we need to look not simply at what's happening in the information space, but also at, at uh, dirty money coming into our political systems and the interaction between them. You know, whether uh, some of these parties are being uh, supported by actors who look like they're internal, but they're actually external, whether there has been uh, training that wasn't particularly indigenous, et cetera, and how now the information tool is being combined with support for political actors on the fringe and that they're being trained. Um, in how to use these techniques to 
up their numbers, uh, polarize society, et cetera. So we need a much clearer, uh, stronger, and more coordinated effort uh, to unearth these, these things. But I would agree with uh, Professor Ridd that it begins with us. Uh, the more we can do to educate our citizens, educate our journalists, not to fall for it, um, and not to uh, jump into a radicalized boiling soup that won't make your country better, it'll only make it more divided, um, the less likely these things are to be effective. So on that point, I think um, you're absolutely right. Uh, by the end of the uh, 1980s, uh, or very early 1990s, we in Estonia had lived um, under Soviet occupation for 50 years. And that meant that the level of propaganda that we received on a daily basis is obviously uncomparable to anything that we're seeing in the free world today. And yet, um, after even five decades, uh, the, uh, the general population uh, had become immune. Mm -hmm. You become immune, and uh, the propaganda ceases to work. So the more transparency, the more understanding there is uh, in the general public as to what exactly is going on, the more immune the society becomes. Yes. Um, I think all of you made that point. Uh, at the same time, though, what we are seeing is directed at us by sovereign governments. And one way uh, uh, to make it stop, because assuming that we want them to stop, is to affect their uh, cost-benefit analysis. Arguably, publication and attribution that General Dallas was talking about is the first step. Uh, you, you need to publicize what you think is going on. You need to attribute, and then you can move on. Before you attribute, it's very difficult to make any uh, follow-on policy or, or even legal steps. So let me ask all of you, uh, are we affecting their cost-benefit analysis? 2018 has been called the year of attribution, um, not only with regards to uh, espionage operations, but also with regards to the Skripal poisoning or many of the propaganda activities. We have started to attribute. Uh, more actively than we did uh, in the past uh, few years. Is that having an effect? If not, then what else should be done so that they would stop? I mean, I would simply start. I always give uh, the French government the most credit in this space because they literally got into the same news cycle as the activities to debunk them. Uh, and therefore, in the context of the Macron election and then the follow-on uh, parliamentary elections, they neutralized the weapon. But again, it was government-led, it was whole of government information, and it was very, very quick. Um, we in the U.S. government in, in 16, and I would argue since, uh, have been very slow on attribution, partly because the standards of attribution are potentially too high, partly because Folks don't want to expose what they, what they know, but if you can't att attribute, you can't neutralize. But it's not simply about that. You have to make it cost. You can choose from a, a menu of things, but there has to be pain and it has to be immediate, whether it's economic pain or whether it's like for like. Um, but I would argue that the pain has been too slow, too diffuse, um, and not clear enough in terms of what it's attributed, what it's uh, set against. Professor? We've seen a lot, of, a lot of change in terms of how attribution uh, was done. It started in 2016. Uh, in 2016, uh, by the way, the um, French, uh, excuse me, the German actually, uh, to a degree, the Swiss government were ahead of the curve. We were able to make um, a couple of outside people make the early call in the 2016 election interference because we could link the breach of the DNC to already attributed breaches in Europe done by GRU. So it was possible on day one to basically have a strong working hypothesis that this is a GRU operation because of German attribution uh, in a different case. So attribution has come a long way. The US especially has come a long way in, term, in terms of putting out highly granular information. Uh, the, the, the series of, of DOJ, of Department of Justice and FBI indictments, 
that lay out, or criminal complaints that lay out in great detail, you know, operator names of PLA operators or Russian operators, sometimes Iranian operators. Forensic evidence that is uncontrovertible, really, in some cases, is quite a remarkable uh, situation. So let me just quickly make two points on the basis of these indictments. The first is, I have no doubt that they are effective as a deterrent instrument. But, I mean, just imagine how demoralizing it is to know that your work could be, you know, end up in an indictment, no more family holidays in Thailand or wherever. You know, your life changes when, you, when you've been indicted like that um, as a foreign operator. You're also but humiliated. But you also get, you know, awards and bonuses and lots of acclaim in your country, right? Sure, but I mean, look at the images that the Department of Justice, along with the, with the Brits and the uh, Dutch, published on GRU <coughs> operations in the context of the Skripal poisoning. I mean, if you see your selfies on a football, in a football stadium with your girlfriend um, or in a bathroom in, a, in, a hot, in, a, in an airport bathroom in Brussels, if you see your selfies with your uniform and your silly smile splashed on the internet, that's really humiliating. I mean, no intelligence operator wants to be in that position because all your colleagues will make jokes for the rest of your life about that. So, but we shouldn't be lured into thinking that operations will stop as a result. Deterrence doesn't mean ac offensive activity will <laughs> stop. It means it will change, maybe go down and change in, in, in character and makes, makes it more costly. Oh, you wanted to say something? Yes. Yeah, go on. <laughs> you finished? I'll just wait. No, no. Um, well, the, 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 um, the other big point that I wanted to make is in the, this attribution game is uh, ultimately also risky. In my mind, it's only a question of time until a foreign adversary will play tit for tat and come, up, come out with a document that reveals you know, British, whatever, American, Israeli activity down to the operator level. So a lot of people who work in the US intelligence community <coughs> are a little concerned and, m you know, maybe check extradition arrangements of holiday destinations uh, mm. before you leave and that kind of thing. It's an unpleasant world we're entering here. General. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I just wanted to um, uh, go to the, to the government and level back to, I think, uh, uh, what the governments have missed is the technological, technological change of the last uh, 10 years that, that uh, civil society around the governments uh, uh, has run away technologically uh, and, 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 and the GRU caught the point and, and they just uh, utilized the weapon uh, of, of that quicker than, than the governments who are who are uh, framed by the values and ethics and all these things, uh, we need to take care of it. We can't do things what, what they do. But I think the way out could be, and you mentioned it, Ambassador, is about how we get the companies who, have, who are on the forefront of the technological development, be it Apple, Microsoft, or all the um, companies dealing with their public, uh, with, the, with this communication, how we get them on board, how, how we make a deal with them that if they don't publish this or this kind of things, or if they, I, I don't think we need to put some, um, what is the word? Uh, Regulation. Not, uh, yeah, but, uh, correct. Whatever, to control the media. We don't need to put the control on media and to say you, you should not say that or that. But to label it, I mean, say this, Russian news TV sends every, we know every day there's a news uh, broadcast which tells you lies. Mm. You should not shut it down, but you should put a label on it. This broadcast yeah. uh, delivers you only lies. A and do it regularly with everything, everywhere. Take a deal, make a deal and say, not close it down, but say these are, and, and then you make kind of a note where you can read what are the lies and how you, Something like that. I don't know, but, but uh, I think we are effective. But I think we can do much more. Uh, but the problem with the governments is uh, everybody does its own strategic communication, and there's no one point where, where the strategic communication. I've seen it in NATO as well. We have talked about NATO needs common lines in Afghanistan. We have talked about it 10 years, but still every minister goes home and take, tells something different. I think th there we can make effort. I was just going to ask about NATO. Um, I mean, this is 
we're in a process where we are defending our way of life, uh, not from tanks or missiles this time around, but from messages that could wreak havoc in our societies. And um, we created NATO to deal with these problems, uh, to stand together and f you know, um, to, to fight for, uh, for, for our way of life. So has NATO managed to adapt itself to these developments, these technological changes, or uh, is the alliance still trying to figure out what's going on? Well, I think the centers of excellence in Tallinn and Riga, or in Finland, the hybrid center of excellence, or in the info operation center of excellence, or cyber center of excellence, I think they are the formats with NATO. Uh, that's, I think, the most NATO can do, to bring others than NATO on board as well, because the cyberspace is not only NATO, it's all the, all the others around it as well, European Union, or all other countries. Uh, so I think NATO as an organization is sti will still needs to remain military organization with the weapons uh, which are the so-called conventional conflict. But it can uh, mediate and bring people around the table and I think Center of Excellence uh, of Cyber Defense has really uh, had success and they're bringing the Japanese and uh, Singapore and others to the table who, like-minded nations, how we would defend our values, uh, value base. Uh, I don't think uh, we we will be able to do or or cyber NATO or something. I, I'm not sure that will work. I mean, my view on this is that NATO has done a good job of improving its own cyber security through these conversations and strategies that we've had, both uh, particularly the the networks that make NATO military operations and political operations happen, but so many of the competencies and tools are either nationally owned or in the European context that are in a, an EU basket rather than a NATO basket that it needs to be a much larger conversation. I think you, we also have not really exercised the NATO muscle on the political side to, to use the structures of NATO to have a common political approach to these issues in part because there's been insufficient U.S. leadership on this front. Well, I, I think it was one uh, serious problem there as well is that the, that the public uh, audiences in uh, all the countries are so different that there's no unified answer to that. That would, the worst thing would be that EU, if EU or NATO would say these are the lines to take and we need to do that and these parties are bad and these are good. So, so it's so unique that the nations themselves and nation states them, them, themselves need to deal with this. But they need to have enough information about modus operandi which is used against them. And I think we, we rather need to share the understanding on how the adversary is uh, dealing but the solution how to solve the problem should be by the nation state still. That's my... Professor? Well, I would just point to an example uh, because it's always fun to have examples. NotPetya was the single most destructive and costly cyber attack ever. Nothing mm -hmm. comes even close. NotPetya happened in about time frame June, uh, July 2017, so not that long ago. In response, uh, rem a remarkable thing happened. Um, the this is a, was a GRU operation that went wrong because it also hit Gaz, Gazprom, Rosneft, a number of Russian banks Might and lenders. Remind everybody what it was. Oh, uh, it was a, a ransomware attack. So a, a camoufla an, an attack that was um, targeted at Ukraine brought down 10% of all Ukrainian uh, computers, which is an extraordinary figure if you think about it. A country of 43 million people, and uh, but it but it got out of control and hit a lot of multinational companies. Uh, it cost billions uh, for the world economy, um, many billions. The mistake, uh, well, Russian, the GRU made a mistake. Probably somebody got into very deep trouble for it because it hit Russian targets and, and, and damaged them as well. But the point is, the United States, together with the UK, I think Estonia was part of the team yeah, as well, yeah. attributed this case publicly. Yes, very quickly. Now. Why, uh, in the context of NATO, this is an interesting example because the uh, US, the Five Eyes essentially, plus a few others, shared intelligence with other NATO countries, notably Germany. Uh, and uh, Germany apparently decided not to join the at joint attribution based on the evidence that it 
seen, we have to assume, we don't know the specifics here. But I mean, if we cannot agree on joint action in a NATO context after this attack, then wh when can we? So I do understand that uh, we have many Estonians in the audience, and Estonians usually don't ask questions, but I see many others as well. <laughs> and um, we have roughly 20 minutes uh, for your uh, questions. I do have several on my list. Before asking the question, please uh, identify yourself. I can see several hands. Non-Estonians are raising their hands. And I presume there are microphones uh, in the room. Yes. So let's start with uh, the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. My name is David Nikoradze. I represent Georgian television station Rustavito in Washington, D.C. I was wondering if you could uh, comment uh, on the initiative of European leaders to create European army. Uh, what do you think? Why the European leaders uh, raised this issue today? And how can it weaken NATO? Thank you very much. Is it the press conference? Well, European army, General Deras. <laughs> I um, think that uh, there are lots of interesting ideas around uh, how to make uh, Europe more efficient in, uh, in the military defense and uh, uh, there were years and, uh, and decades where Europe uh, thought uh, that, uh, that no war is possible and so uh, the Europeans were not spending money on that. Today, everybody has seen the need of, uh, of conventional military. Uh, they, the countries try to find different formats, how to, how to bridge the gaps we have in the European defense. Therefore, uh, the European Army uh, initiative is just one of the, of the ways how, how we could make our, our European Army stronger. But, uh, I think it was more theoretical still at the current moment. I would not have anything against it if, if one day we would have European, European army as strong as the US, uh, US armed forces today uh, dealing w with, with all, all, the, all the territory. But I think the political solution is so far away that I would not speculate about the army before that. I think the, the it needs to be politically proved, and today it is just one country's president having the idea. I think that is a far, far way. But uh, to cooperate more, to make uh, our uh, efforts uh, more efficient on developing our armed forces, therefore, for example, format as PESCO, which has been seen as there something against US, I don't think so. I think the PESCO. Uh, is, uh, is, is one of the projects which, uh, which can make European armed forces stronger and perhaps in 20 or 40 or 50 years bring us to the EU common European army. But today I don't think the political will is there at all. So let's take three questions now. Um, let's start from this side uh, in the front here. Um, yes, Merla. Thank you. Thank you for a great conversation, a great panel. Uh, Merla Maigra, uh, representing the Estonian private cybersecurity company, Cybexer. Well, a lot of the discussion of, on disinformation is very closely linked with cybersecurity, and I'm glad this came out uh, towards the end of this discussion. My question builds on the moderator's comment on how much we can affect the cost-benefit consideration of the opponent. And I'd be interested in your comments on the cyber offensive. Thanks. Could you hand over the microphone to... Yes. Let's take three. Let's take three questions and then ask them and then go. Uh, yeah. May I ask two yes. questions very quickly? You can. Uh, my name is Valeria Egisman, Voice of America. So uh, my question is, uh, what are the main impediments to create the coordinated strategy uh, between uh, the US and you to uh, counter Russian influence operations? and what are the uh, main threats that remain. And my second question is, uh, do you think that the US administration has addressed the vulnerabilities uh, discovered in 2016 elections and prepared well enough for midterms and going forward for uh, to 2020 presidential elections? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector for UACUWIUU in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I have uh, a, a joint question for the panel and for the general. Uh, first of all, uh, with respects to a coordinated effort, as you've all expressed, on addressing the, uh, the disinformation that is being presented out of Russia, how do you see that b at action plan coming together so that it can happen? And then, General, with regard to Crimea, uh, my, uh, my knowledge was that an, um, there were many Ukrainian military, I mean, Ukra you, uh, there was many Ukrainian military in Crimea that uh, turned on their oath to uh, Ukraine and went over to, to facilitate the Russian invasion. How would you see being sure something like that couldn't happen with other countries? Thank you. Okay, powerful stuff. Cyber offensive um, or U.S. midterms. Well, Ambassador, let's start. <laughs> Pick which, which one you would, you would like best. Yeah. Um, you know, as I touched on lightly, I think cyber offenses are an option, obviously. Um, we've used them. Other countries have used them. There are a lot of complications. Um, Thomas pointed to one of them. They can go wrong. Uh, they also can expose sources and methods in a way that neutralizes your ability to use them again. Um, but in the context of uh, President Putin, my experience is that he uh, appreciates clarity and that he understands reciprocity. And so, um, you know, I think there is a question of whether we should have an escalatory ladder that we can. Um, do a little bit better displaying in terms of what we, what is possible when we are attacked in this way in terms of response, but you have to be very careful, obviously. Um, in terms of whether we've hardened here in the United States, I think there's been a lot of good work done, but obviously insufficient work on the physical in infrastructure of elections in terms of going back to not purely electronic voting and counting and all those kinds of things to have redundancy on paper to ensure that machines uh, are not back officed by nefarious actors, all those kinds of things. I think the harder thing to both measure and deal with is the uh, effect on voter psychology of accelerating and exacerbating um, nasty politics, divisive politics, uh, one-sided politics, how do you ensure that the folks in the conversation are actually real Americans and not influenced from the outside in, in ways that are illegal. Um, and that would be hard in, in any kind of society. Um, my answer to why we haven't gotten this conversation going properly is a matter of US leadership. I think we'd have to make it a national priority from the president down, and we'd have to create the structures to, to have it. Yes, sir. Uh, there are a couple of things happening already that, um, depending on the view you take, could be already be the outcome of some form of offensive uh, operation. So I'll just name a few, and I don't think any of them is, but just to make a larger point. We've seen a number of different outlets in, in Russia itself that have published or document uh, uh, have published data on the Kremlin and uh, Kremlin close to the Kremlin, and, where it, and it's completely unclear how they got the data. So Shalta Balta being one, the uh, Russian version of Humpty Dumpty, uh, the dossier center Khodorkovsky's um, pl new publication platform have uh, seem to have some impressive sources, and of course you can um, count Bellingcat in that group who also seem to have some rather impressive Russian sourcing going on. Now, I don't think there's anything, we don't know, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that or problematic here. But I would just point out that President Putin, if we take his word at face value uh, in a Russian Q&A session uh, in St. Petersburg, believes that the Panama Papers of April 3rd, 2016, were already an American operation against him. Now, I don't, that, that is not the case, I would assume. 
There's no evidence whatsoever pointing to that. But if he believes that he's already been at the receiving end of a major intelligence operation, then he es and you know then he escalates it in, in the follow-on effect. That raises an interesting conceptual question for us, and that is, how do you design operations? You know, you can show escalatory potential, obviously, mm -hmm. but how do you design operations to de-escalate? So, for example, sending texts, uh, text messages which possibly Cyber Command has done recently to Russian operators saying, hey, by the way, you, we see you developing, you know, not Petya 2.0. You may want to cool it down a little bit because we know who you are. Maybe that has a de-escalatory de effect. I don't know. But that's an interesting question to ask. General Deros, Crimea. Yeah, well, the, uh, first for, op I think, to the offensive operations, I think that these are tool which... Uh, uh, is a force multiplier for a small country if it's used properly, but it can be used only once, and that was mentioned here. So that needs to be in your uh, nomenclatura, but uh, to use it is very dangerous. And the second thing which comes with it, if anybody uses a, a kind of a cyber, whatever, uh, malware, then we should be careful about the proliferation. Uh, even in the cyberspace, somebody can take over the malware and use against you or somebody else, and how you control that. That is uh, possible, at least, uh, technically. So I think that these are the dangers. I think uh, offensive weapons need to be developed in cyberspace in order to understand how it works for yourself and the cyber defense. And the second, you can use it, but only once. Uh, what uh, about Crimea? Our, uh, I think that is what I was mentioning about the cohesion of the country and believing in your country. Uh, um, in Ukraine, as far as we know, last uh, three years before the conflict already there was systematic uh, downgrading of the military capability because the Minister of Defense was actually a Russian citizen. Uh, Minister of Defense of Ukraine was actually a Russian citizen. Uh, and there was many, uh, many, there were many people, Russian speakers, Russian influenced, or even from the same uh, space. And the Ukrainians really had difficulties, and I've served with them together during my uh, conscription, uh, difficulties to separate between Russia and, and, and being Russian and Ukrainian, kind of brothers, uh, not separable. I think Russia did, or uh, Putin did the biggest mistake to go with a force against Ukraine because Ukraine has become a country. Uh, pretty, uh, they, they need to work on their corruption and all this, but at least the statehood and understanding of the state, and that's the, something different to, um, uh, to what was uh, before that is there. Uh, and that, I think that they need to keep the cohesion of the uh, society. Then the officers will not uh, change sides. I'm absolutely convinced. And, and they will be much, much stronger as a nation. Um, and I hope for them that that will go that way. Time for three more. The gentleman right here. Uh, for ge uh, Eric Mueller required. Uh, for Could you wait for, wait for the mic? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Eric Neeler from Wired. Um, General Tarras, I was visiting in Tapa uh, military facility two years ago, uh, an American striker brigade that was there to do some training with Estonian Defense Forces. Uh, it was part of a larger effort to get, you know, British, other NATO troops in the Baltics. Has that made a difference uh, militarily with deterrence? We're talking about deterrence today uh, since this has occurred. And on the cyber side, there were fears at the time that uh, U.S. and other troops would be harassed uh, in Russian uh, efforts, Russian um, uh, me active measures in, in social media and so forth. Has that happened? Was that fear uh, actually occur? Thank you. Uh, the lady right there. She's right behind you. Oh, hi. Thank you. Katerina Sudova, recently out of School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. I had the pleasure of spending uh, a little time doing research at NATO STRATCOM Center of Excellence, very excellent uh, center to those of us from Latvia here in the audience. My question is, um, recent efforts, especially in the last week with the Paris Peace Conference, have highlighted um, the role of private sector, a much stronger role that some 
companies are taking in trying to build defense at the global level and cooperating with governments um, from that perspective. Uh, initiatives from Microsoft is just one such effort. Uh, there are others. Um, but they are in a fundamental tension with the offensive operations of nation states. I wanted to get your reaction and your thoughts on how effective this could be and um, what's the path forward. And the gentleman right in front of you. Hi, my name is Emilio Icielo. Uh, this question is for Professor Ridd, but the panel is welcome as well. Um, so you mentioned that we shouldn't overestimate the success of uh, active measures in the 2016 um, election. And I was wondering, based on the research that you're doing for your book, looking at all the past examples, um, would you, in your opinion, think that um, either a restricted information environment is better for active measures or an open one like we had uh, this past? Thank you. Professor, let's start with that last question. A restrict, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question because it all depends on what you mean by restricted information environment. An open society? Uh, so um, as opposed to like um, Russia, for example, where there's more uh, of an oversight yeah. of, of media or, or things yeah. like that, yeah. where, where yeah. the media is curbed yeah. by the government as opposed to... Yeah, of course. I mean, democracies, there's no question that open societies are more vulnerable to active measures. Active measures are historically really a, a tool that is employed by a non-democratic system against a democratic system. It's, a, it's an asymmetric tool in that sense. Um, but of course, uh, open democracies are also highly resilient and uh, can take quite a lot. And I'm, I'm sure we'll make it through this uh, period um, at s somehow. Um, but I, but I, but I take your question and make an, a, a point that is actually slightly different, but extremely important and gets nowhere near the attention it should get. And that is the question of what is public in the first place? Mm. And how can we keep it public? Deletion and ar archiving are some of the hottest issue on the internet today. So make this, make, make, and it's linked to active measures. Let's make this real for a moment. We all share two intuitions. We, sh we think 18 year olds who said something stupid on Twitter should be able to delete right, their posts. But we also all share the uh, intuition that presidents who said something stupid on Twitter should not be able to delete their posts. So how do you reconcile the two if you're a platform provider? And the answer is it's very hard, and Twitter has no good answer, by <laughs> the way, to this problem. Facebook also dodges the question because of the way they design their platform. But for me as a historian, I'm just, um, this is extremely difficult because what is public today will not be public anymore in a year, certainly not in five years. The, the shape of what's public, historically, we had institutions like the Library of Congress who froze the public conversation uh, in time at one point. Of course, conferences like this were not archived in the Library of Congress either. I'm, I'm not naive. But, um, but a lot was, was archived. Today, that is not so much the case anymore. A lot of information that is public at one moment in time will disappear. The internet forgets a lot every day. So we have no good answer to that problem. And why is this so important? Because it means that operators Active measures operators can, di can achieve a very short-term effect and then clean up the public domain, remove evidence of operations because of the way the system is designed. Mm. EFP? Mm. General Davis? Yeah, well, uh, the, the fir first answer is yes, and the second answer is no. But it can be... Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you can pick the <laughs> but, but, but it can be a bit elaborated on it. I don't... Uh, I, I, it's not about uh, 120 American soldiers or, or, uh, or uh, one company of, uh, of, of, uh, of main battle tanks in Estonia. It's about the decisions made unanimously at NATO, which uh, made a difference. And the, and, the, and the decisions not to send 20 uh, staff officers with the different uniforms and berets as a kind of a measure, but to send uh, 5, 000, more than 5,000 troops uh, to the region, if necessary, on the permanent basis, uh, uh, well, uh, persistently rotating, I think that was the uh, expression they used. Uh, anyway, always there. Uh, I think that was a message. Uh, and the other message was the uni unity of effort or the unanimous decision all around the table, all NATO's nations decided together we'll do it. And all are there, 19 nations right now already are there in different uh, EFPs. Uh, that's the like uh, emotional side, but for Putin it was important that this was main paddle tanks and not uh, 
what kind of um, uh, analyze centers or something. I mean, it was hard power. It increased the capability significantly in the region as well because they are on the high readiness force level. Uh, so we are happy. We are unhappy that there are no American soldiers among them in the Baltic states, but we hope that will change in, in, in the future as well. But they have not been harassed. There have been two, uh, two cases in Lithuania uh, where we can, which we can identify. But since we were all expecting that, so the case was published and the news were there all over the place, we, media did exactly the wrong thing to do with it. Not to talk it to about it and that will disappear, but if you make a big thing about it, then they were successful with, with this attack. Uh, but in Estonia we have not had anything uh, which we can count as an active measure against the EFP uh, in country or even from outside the country, uh, even from Russia. So no, we have not had. And, and finally, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll moderate the, the question on the private sector a little bit. Um, and we talked about the whole of government, and that goes without saying that uh, there's not a single department or a single ministry in, in European governments that is in charge of all of this. Mm -hmm. And hence, we need to bring everybody else together. The same thing, though, uh, is true. Uh, the, the same thing can, however, be said of the government in general that uh, since we're talking about the cyber st space and we're talking about information space, these, these spaces do not belong, belong to the government. Right. So what we need, and we've been talking in Estonia for quite some time now, is a whole of society approach. We need to bring the NGOs, the universities, the media, the private sector on board and, 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 and somehow work together. Uh, that's always easier said than done, especially uh, in uh, larger uh, nations. In Estonia, one of the things we've done to bring the private sector and the government together is make use of our uh, voluntary defense organization that General Deros alluded to earlier, the Defense League, our version of the National Guard, where um, you know you, it doesn't matter who you are in, a, in your private life, uh, you join uh, an infantry unit, you get training, uh, and you function as an infantry platoon or company or eventually a battalion. Now we uh, determined a few years ago that we could we, we could distinguish between who people are, and not everybody needs to run around in the woods and shooting rifles. So we brought together journalists. The Propostop is one of the examples uh, who voluntarily wanted to join. Um, we brought together uh, uh, cybersecurity experts, whom we could never afford to hire as a government. Um, the, 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 the people who work for our banks or telecommunications companies and who at the same time want to do something for national defense. So we brought them together. They joined the, our National Guard. Um, we're, we're working, collaborating uh, increasingly with the, uh, with the universities and the NGOs, making use also of the NATO <coughs> Cyber uh, Center of Excellence in Tallinn. And, th and that's not to say that we know how to do it uh, or that we're happy with the level of um, cohesion uh, that we find in our public-private interactions. Can, can this work in larger states? C can this work in the United States? Um, and if so, what ought to be done uh, to make it work? I mean, I think we have to we have to try. This is why I make these two recommendations. The first, that we need a standing public-private commission on these issues that brings the companies together with government and the best in the academy, et cetera, to look at the full range of regulatory, legal, deterrence tools. Uh, but on the second hand, if companies are going to be willing to help government in that way. Government has to be willing to help companies. I think part of the question was how do companies stand up to big monolithic governments and two of the biggest actors in this space are governments uh, only if they have the protection and support and a unified policy response from their own state. So I think you need both of those. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 1 p.m. Uh, that means that we are concluding this discussion. The, the topic is such that we could go on for hours, if not days. I'm sure there are follow-on events uh, all around DC, uh, all around the Euro-Atlantic community. This is an important topic. It is, I think, important that we discuss it as publicly as we can. Uh, I hope uh, you've enjoyed the discussion. I know that there were, the, there were many other questions that uh, we don't have time to address today. 
but hopefully there will be other events like this to follow. Please join me in thanking the outstanding panel. Uh, and thank you. Thank you.